Small Fire Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. This week, the week of May 29th, rolling into June. Monday is Memorial Day, a day that we reflect, a day that we think of our service members uh, here and abroad, protecting our freedoms and allowing us to do what we do at home. And uh, for that, I am grateful for those that serve and protect my freedom. Thank you. I appreciate all of you, and we'd love to hear from you. Don't be afraid to use the email at podcast at nationalfireradio.com. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you're serving overseas or domestically here within our country, protecting our borders and freedoms. We'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email, podcast at nationalfireradio.com. We'd love to hear from you. Hear where you are, what you do, where you're stationed. Um, I think it'd be great. We'd love to share some of those stories. So don't be afraid to reach out. Anyway, this week, all new episodes by National Fire Radio. Some great heavy hitters. Some very powerful episodes will be coming out as well as a new episode from The Size Up on this Tuesday. So thanks for tuning in. As always, please do me a favor and give our sponsors a quick listen before we roll into the daily episode. Hey guys, before we start the podcast real quick, I want to mention the Gone to Texas Fire Forum and Expo being held in Arlington, Texas on June 9th and 10th. Myself, I'm going to be emceeing the event for two days with nationally renowned speakers that will be there for the weekend. Mo Davis, Clyde Gordon, Rick George, Mickey Farrell, Jacob Johnson, Dennis Riley, and so on. The list goes on and on. I was there last year, helped emcee the event last year. It is a growing conference in an incredible venue globe life field which is home to the texas rangers in arlington texas right in the entertainment district right at the pbr bar which we're going to have a social after the first night i'm telling you right now there's no other venue like this the room actually overlooks the field you get to walk the stadium it is such a cool venue arlington texas june 9th and 10th check them out go on to texasfireforum.com or go to facebook and look them up there too go on the texas fire forum where you can buy your tickets get great hotel rates and if anybody's asking you where you're going this summer you tell them go on to texas this episode's brought to you by taylor's tins taylor and her crew at taylor's tins have been manufacturing aluminum helmet fronts since 2017 with over 200,000 tins in the market they are a leader in the helmet front space Custom design, one-offs to department orders. They can turn them around within 24 to 48 hours. Customer service is what they pride themselves on, and they provide nothing but top-shelf product and service to their customers. Check them out at taylorstins.com and check out their full line of product offering. They've always been a very strong supporter since day one with the National Fire Radio podcast and platform, and Taylor and his crew have become dear friends of ours, and we appreciate the support. And at checkout, for a little extra bonus, use coupon code NFR sent me. That's NFR sent me for a discount on your order. Exclusions do apply. Anyway, check out taylorstins.com for the latest and greatest offerings from Taylor and his crew. And in the words of Taylor, stop burning up leather. Hey everyone, Jeremy, National Fire Radio. Welcome back to the show today. Today is going to be a fantastic episode. A guy that I was super intimidated by at the get. It's one of those names in the fire service that, well, I was nervous about. And, uh, and through all that many years ago, as, we, uh, as I cold called him to help me with a project, from there I think a friendship has formed. And uh, today I'm absolutely honored to have uh, Lieutenant Steve Robertson, Division of Fire from Columbus, Ohio. Steve, thanks for joining me, man. It's nice to have you on. Uh, absolutely, Jeremy. I appreciate you asking me to do it. I'm always uh, obliged to do things like this. I think it's... Uh, a great form to get stuff out there and, and spread the word. I appreciate that. Right. So like, and that's what this is really all about for me, right? It's being able to capture the stories of those that have been out there and doing it. And I think that we have an obligation to push the job forward by storytelling. And I think that's a big part of it um, for yourself. 33 years in the fire service, 30 years with, like I said, Columbus, Ohio division of fire, currently a Lieutenant engine company, 18 in the South Linden neighborhood. Um, you know, Columbus is a tough town. Um, you know, 30 years in, in Columbus, I'm sure you've been there, done that. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to work at busy companies my entire career. I had a short stint a couple of years down uh, running recruit training, but um, I, I've just been blessed to have great bosses and learn from 
from guys that are just legends in our job here in Columbus and, and, you know, be taught the right way, what I feel is the right way by them and, and being mentored by them still to this day, uh, you know, and you just try to, you just try to pass on what they've taught you and you take your mistakes and, and try to pass those on. So, you know, people don't make the same mistake. But not everybody dives in, right? So, like, you can dive in and be a good fireman, right? Good line fireman, be a good officer and have mentors. But it's not everyone steps out of their comfort zone and goes out and uh, wants to teach, wants to wants to be a teacher. Um, where did that all start from from you? Was that early on in your career? I mean, were you always into training and, and so on? Or did that evolve with your career in the fire service? Uh, a little of both, actually. I, I had a great boss named Bob Cloud, Lieutenant. Uh, he, when I got there, he was on Rescue 2. I, when I got to Station 2 downtown, and back then it was actually the busiest station in the nation there a couple of years. Mm. And um, and we had a – he just – his whole mindset was training-based. That Even when – we back then, though, that was the early 90s, and, and we, we would go to – you know, if you went – didn't go to a fire in a couple of days. It was like everybody was ready to kill each other. Yeah. But you went to enough fires that you made a mistake. You it was your you were in the barrel. You went and trained on it until you had another fire, and you didn't do the same thing. So it was a lot of positive peer pressure back then. And I watched the way the guys in the firehouse respected Lieutenant Cloud for one reason. It was he knew the job. He not only knew the job, he expected, his expectations were so much higher than the divisions, and he held you to those. But he didn't just hand you a sheet of paper saying, here's the expectations I have of you as a fireman here at this firehouse. No, he went through every one of those with you, took time to ensure you could meet them, not yeah. just said, here it is. Like, like I'm not going to hold you accountable when you can't physically do it or you don't know how to do it. I, I, that's that's probably one of the biggest things that I hate to hear in leadership is they say have expectations, which I agree with wholeheartedly as a company officer. Sure, but you don't take the time to ensure that person can meet your expectations. You're setting them up for failure, and I think that's a huge problem that that a lot of folks don't on the back end say. You can't just hand them a sheet of paper. You've got to work with them and make sure they're doing it the way you want to do it to be able to meet the expectations. So it takes I work. think expectation. Yeah. It, it, and it takes work from the company officer. Yeah. You can't just, you can't just hand them the paper and go, we're good. That's right. I, I can't believe you didn't do that. Like, like it, you got to invest in your people. And when you do, it, 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 you're paid back tenfold. I'm telling you, you're going to be paid back tenfold when things just have to get done. Yeah, I wrote down while you were talking, I wrote down, um, you know, he knew the job, right? The the gentleman that was your mentor, he knew that he knew the job and he instilled that into you, but then gave you the leash to go learn it. But the expectations were done on the asphalt. It's done on the pavement. Oh, absolutely. It was it was done way before the fire. Yes. Right. And, and you and you and you made mistakes. We're human beings, but we still fell well above the division standard because his expectations were so high. Uh, it, you know, we made mistakes, but yet how many folks really realized the mistakes because we were very critical of ourselves. Yeah. I, I love hearing about those companies that have standards higher than the department standards, right? Because I, I typically find through conversation and seeing it firsthand when I'm out traveling and talking with people is that those are the companies that people want to be a part of. There's a high level of expectations for their people. Their people need to meet it. And they need to learn and grow as individuals. But the but the uh, the esprit de corps, you know, the, the mission of the company is greater and it's greater than the department's minimum. And that is so freaking important. And it's greater than any individual. Yes. That's that's the other thing you got to remember. You know, not everybody is going to be able to be a part of that. Let's let's be reality. Like sometimes it's physical standards that hold them back that you can work toward. Sometimes they're just not buying in. I get it. And, and, and you know, when they don't buy in, I, I'm going to use a, a, an analogy, um, and it's part of accountability in my mind. Uh, Captain Greg Glass was another legend here in my job uh, from, from Truck One, and, and, and he said, you know, Stevie, every now and then you got to pull the weeds to make the garden grow. I love that. Because you, you, you work, 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 but it's no different than telling your kid, don't do that again or else. 
don't do that again or else. Don't do that again or else. If there's not a consequence to their decisions, you're never going to change it. You're never going to get the buy-in you need to, to make that work. That I'm writing that down. I love that. You got to pull the weeds to make the garden grow. There, there is something really deep there. And I believe in that wholeheartedly, but man, does that take accountability? And you know, but, but, it, mm-hmm. but, but here's the thing. You can't just indiscriminately pull indiscriminately hammer somebody. Correct. hundred percent process. There's a process behind that. You That's have right. To help them. You, you got to give them an opportunity to succeed and you've got to, you've got to put the time in. And then when it comes down to the hard conversation, is there something I haven't done for you to make you successful? Is there something the company hasn't done for you to make you successful, to make you a part of this company? It's what the- else can we do? Well, I don't know. Well, guess what? You, you know, we, we've got some hard decisions to make. Maybe just this isn't the spot for you. Well, that's it. You, you, you know, like it isn't personal. It's not, I'm not running you out. But these are the standards we're going to adhere to. And if you don't want to be a part of that, maybe it's time to move on to another company. I think there's, you know? yeah, good, please. It's a hard, it's a hard discussion to have, but that's, I think that's another problem in the fire services. Company officers want the t-shirt, but they don't understand the hard discussions are why you're getting paid. Yeah. That, that's why there's a differential in having those hard discussions all they justifies to the rest of the company what that their sacrifices and them taking the extra time and putting more time in is justified that i'm not going to allow someone to come into this company and do it half-assed it's just not going to happen it's the ownership of the position by the officer himself Right. I mean, we talk Correct. about that Absolutely. servant servant leadership, right? Yes, we work for our people and good bosses do. They want their people to succeed. I think you're absolutely right. The coin has flipped a little bit and it's almost like at times we want people not to succeed because I think there's this inherent sense of showmanship or I might be shown up because maybe I'm not as confident as I used to be or I once was or, or could be in my position. And so I can't allow this guy to be any better than me because I'm barely hanging on myself. And I think that that is something that's truly plaguing our job today i agreed and i think we can add one thing to that jeremy and that is when you when you look at this whole thing and it, any company officer can take a stud out of the academy yeah i can take the number one academic and he's the number one physical and he comes to 18 he conforms right away everything's great what about the guy that's in that middle 33 percent? can i take that guy and make him excel yeah if you really want to, if you really want to take a good company officer and look at that, they're a good company officer. Take the mediocre guy and make them good. That's where you see if a program and that company is working together. Is when you take a mediocre firefighter out of the academy. You they don't even have to be out of the academy. You take a mediocre firefighter and you do what to them? You watch them grow, excel, and be part of the of the solution. That's the company officer that you want to strive to be. You, you, it's great to get the studs, but at the same time, I have as much, if not more, pride in taking somebody that struggled and bringing them to a level where they're, they're not only competent, but they're su- succeeding and excelling in the, in the job. I get so excited watching people succeed. Like for me, and I think that's a lot of what I've done with National Fire Radio is I love putting people on. I want to bring attention to other people that have a story to share. And for me, if I can be the facilitator of that and have a community in which people are interested in hearing stories from people that might otherwise never had the opportunity to share their story to help someone else along the line, I mean, then I'm doing my part. And the thing is, is as a leader, as somebody in the firehouse, as a friend, as a family man, a husband, a, a, a father, you want your kids, your wife, your friends, your firemen to succeed. And if you don't want that, you really have to question where you are and why. Yeah, why are you in that position? Right. I, I, you know, I've had guys, everybody asks me, I'm either the smartest guy in the job, Columbus, or the dumbest, because I've been a company officer for almost 22 years. Mm. But just a lieutenant. I never promoted off, right? So I'm either the smartest guy or the dumbest guy. And, and I've got guys <laughs> now... Yeah. But I got guys now that I've trained and several are battalion chiefs. Sure. You know, several are deputies. It's like 
I'm okay with that. I'm proud of that. Some guys get upset when people pass them. That's your choice. That's your choice. If, 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 if I, I, I'm getting two guys promoted on this next list. I had one guy finish third, one guy finish 20th on the list. So they're both going to be lieutenants. That makes me happy. Yes. I want to see them succeed even farther. Yes. You know, because I, I know what kind of company officers they're going to be, and it's going to make the job better. Well, what's fun for you, too, is you're the type of manager, the type of boss, the type of mentor that instilled what you knew in of the job into them so you can now watch that flourish i had a great conversation the other day where we talked about the ability of i don't know if i was ready but i got promoted to that position but that position now allows you to make more change and if you come up through the process and the system in a way that reinforces the best of the job you're then facilitating the ability to make that change on say a battalion chief level and that's hugely important to guys like yourself and the rank and file backstep firemen if you wait to get to promote until you're ready, it's kind of like having kids. There you go. You'll never do it. Yeah. You'll never do it. You, you, you've got to be competent, and you have to be competent in your basic skills, but you're not going to have all the experience. I still run into situations all the time where I go, oh, boy, what am I doing with this? That's reality. That There's no cookie-cutter answer to all this. You just take what you've learned, take your SOPs, start down that road and then deviate where you need to, to make it work. Sometimes it's ugly the way it works. Yeah. And that's a, that's an interesting conversation. And this is uh, you and I were kind of chatting about it before we started. I'd love to go down this road a little bit because I know, you know, seeing you at all these conferences, I mean, it should be said that you speak nationally, you travel literally like every other weekend or close to it. I mean, I know how much travel you book. I know how many conferences you're going to, how many people you are affecting change in their lives and educating them about the success of the engine company primarily on the fire ground is really your mission. The stretching for success class is hugely important to you. But you are also a boss, uh, an engine company boss, who outside of these conferences are still going to the firehouse on your tours. You're still mentoring and leading an engine company in a neighborhood. It's a tough neighborhood at that. And so you are seeing other things other than just going to fires. And you don't, I've never really heard you often talk about the other aspects of of the job other than being an engine company boss and stretching lines, because that's what your program is primarily about. But take me down the road a little bit about Steve Robertson in the firehouse, in the neighborhood, what it means and uh, to be embedded in a neighborhood like that and how you get your people to sign in and jump on board and, and so on. Cause I'm really interested in that aspect of Steve Robertson. The, the first thing I'll tell you is I love my city. Columbus, Ohio is a great city, but it's like any other major metropolitan city. It's growing crazy. Uh, we, they're expecting a million people to move in in the wow. next five to 10 years. Mm. Uh, it's just booming crazily right now. But we, every city has it, but we, we're in a very low-income neighborhood. It's pri- primarily African-American. It's just a very low-income neighborhood. Yeah. Now, with that being said, we have some tremendous people in that neighborhood that, sure. are, that, are, that are leaders in the neighborhood that want everything to, to go the way they to, – to be – uh, perfect and peaceful and great. But unfortunately, we know that's not the society we live in. Yeah. And we have a high, very high, uh, high area of shoots and, mm. and violence. And, you know, unfortunately, that's everywhere. Um, only thing I can tell you is try to make a difference every day to somebody in that neighborhood. I don't care if it's your first call or your hundredth call. You, you know, we're running 15 to 20 runs on the engine a day on an average. And if that's your mother, how would you want her treated? You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and when you start treating people like that, regardless if they have money or don't have money, when you treat them with the same respect you treat the person in the richest neighborhood of the city, it doesn't take very long to get respect from the neighborhood. You know, the bad people are going to be bad people. And that 90% of the people in Linden are great people. Uh, they're just poor. Yes. They're, but they're very good people. Mm-hmm. The ten percent are bad, or just bad people, and there's nothing we're going to do to change that. Yeah, but maybe we can influence that kid walking down the street. I love that. You know, hey, what's up? What's up, buddy? What are you doing today? What? What? Are you, what's going on? You know what I mean? Like, I, I do. Just, just conversate. I think sometimes it's... you get, you know, mind your business, and other times you get a young man that'll stop in the firehouse every day. Hey, let me get you a pop. Let's let's talk. What's going on at school? You, you know, just. <sighs> Just common, con- hey, I tell you who the best at this, who taught me really how to do that was Mike Champo. Yeah. Michael Champo, I've never been in a conference where we're doing 
acquired structures, and usually they're in the lower income neighborhoods. The first people he grabs is who? The kids. Yep. Right. The kids. I don't care where, whether we were at FDIC, it didn't matter. Michael made sure they got to see the fire truck. They got to they got to hook a little ceiling or do whatever. Michael engaged with everybody there to try to leave a positive influence of the fire service. And I really took that for Mike that that man, it just it doesn't take a lot to change somebody and it doesn't take a lot to go man, maybe I want to do that. Yes. Maybe, maybe this is what I want to do. I want to be that person. And, and Michael has done it his entire career. And, and I just wanted that because he, he really is. I've never seen anybody reach out the way he does. Yeah. I, you know, I heard stories, I'm even speaking with Mike, you know, and, um, and so on, but like the, the extra lunches, you know, distributing the them to the yeah. kids, right? Like in the in the neighborhoods after hot training or during hot training, there's leftover food or drinks. All the you know. time. Yeah. All the time. And but that takes work, Steve. Like, wh- how do we how do we teach empathy? If you want to embed yourself in the community, so many guys get turned off by having to go pick up these people fifteen times a tour, and they get they get burned out from it. How do we keep? How do we save face? How do you teach these guys that empathy matters and the impact they can leave could literally change the lives of some of these people? I think some of that comes with age. Yes. I, I truly do age and experience. Yeah. But I will I give Columbus Fire another kudos. They started a couple programs. One is called Spark. And, and what it does is our frequent flyers. Mm. When we flag it on an EMS report that this person, we've run on this person four times in four days or four, you know, four times in two days, they get a visit from our people. What can we do for you? You know, it's a lift assist three or four times. It's getting to be a thing. They, they mark it. They come see him. Hey, you know what? You need a wheelchair ramp. Let's work with social services to get you a wheelchair ramp. Yeah. Um, the, the, the overdoses that are constant. We have a react team now. Hey, this is the, the second overdose. Every time we take them during the react shows up at the hospital, talks to him, tries to get him in rehab. There's things that Columbus is doing that I think is at the forefront. And we've actually seen a huge impact in our frequent flyers. They don't, they, they're looking for help. They don't know where to get it. And these folks that are doing that work, it's social workers, police, fire. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a combination of everybody. And, and these folks are actually getting in the neighborhoods, making relationships, and it's truly making a difference. So that has helped us immensely in cutting down some of that, Jeremy. Like, oh, yeah, the runs are still there. Yeah. The runs are still there. But these folks don't know where to turn and giving them an opportunity or a place to turn has sure helped them a a bunch. Yeah. And you know what I like hearing about that too, right? Is where a fire department is willing to put programs in place, but the, but the guys that are on the streets a day in and day out can see the difference that programs make. It allows them to understand that the, the initial work or hands-on attention that they're giving that individual will directly affect them in, in a short period of time because the other programs can kick in. And when you guys can see a return on your investment, right? It's a win. Your people then can buy in even more because they understand the importance of those interactions in the beginning. Yeah. It, you know, it's not going to go to without saying that there was absolutely some heartache at first. Sure. Of you course. Know, we were, we were a couple hundred guys short when they put these programs in. Right. And they're pulling, they're pulling firefighters off the street to fill these positions. Yeah. We're screaming like mash cats. Like, what are you doing? Right. Like, you know, I'm, run, I'm running short every day and and we're adding positions. Well, they did a mass hiring and it's helped a bunch. And now we're back. Our staffing starting to get back to where it needs to be. And we're truly now two or three years into this thing, seeing the benefits of it. But is there growing pains with it? Absolutely. Sure. There is. Any program. But, you know, our fire chief, Jeff Hat, I, I can't tell you. He's phenomenal. I was fortunate enough to come on with Chief Hat, but uh, he's wide open. If it's not working, change it. But we're not going to sit still. We're going to change things. If it doesn't work, we're going to change it. You know, Assistant Chief Tim Moore, our operations chief, same thing. We're going to try stuff. And if some of it's not going to work, but we're not going to be stagnant because that's the way we've always done it. I freaking love that. So it's very refreshing 
yeah. to, to see this happen. Yeah, you know? because most so, administrations will never fall down if they, it, you know, they put a program in place, and if it doesn't work, they still stand behind it, right? Because it's their it's their brainchild, and any administration that's willing to use realistic uh, uh, approach and say we're going to try something because we don't know we don't know how to handle this. 100%. So let's try things and see what works, what doesn't work. And an administration that will do that can certainly get much more buy-in from their people. Knowledge without experience is theory. I love that. Right? that yes. We've got, yes. We've got a lot of theory. And, and without experience-based theory, it's just knowledge. I can read a book and have all, and all the knowledge in the world. But till I vet that information myself on a, on a fire... It's just knowledge, right? It's just theory. It's pure theory. It's not knowledge. It's, I've got the knowledge, but it's theory until it's proven. I love that. It's one of my favorite quotes. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, I love that. I think I've heard you say that before. Uh, is that your line? I'm just curious. No, it no. is not. It is not. I, I, and I honestly don't know where. Yeah, I don't either. There. Okay. Um, I, I heard uh, Bob Carn from Rescue 16. Got it. Uh, retired, another mentor used it years ago and yeah. I'm like man that's that's absolutely legit it is right to you the know? point man knowledge without experience is just theory that hits hard man when you sit back and think about that and when you start looking at your own career right i mean we were talking the other day or we were talking earlier about the other day and you you have had a rash of shootings in your first two um, yeah. you got your playbook and how to respond when they come in. And you said you're turning out 15, 20 times a tour on your engine company and you're dealing with, you know, overdoses and shootings in between fires and all that. Right. And yep. not, not everything goes to plan. Right. So, yeah, I had an incident a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of the nicest areas in Columbus, the short North, and you've been there, Jeremy, yeah. the firehouse Expo. yes, yes. Uh, it's, you know, five-star restaurants and, and really nice bars. It's our, it's our main nightlife area in Columbus. And, and we had a, it appeared to be, I don't know factually, but appeared to be a gang related shooting. I was, I was in um, a rescue coordinator position. I slide across the bay every now and then and, and jump in the car. And that position basically is the rescue supervisor for the day. Mm. So you go to every working fire, a, you go to all technical rescues. Sounds like a, jobs. sounds like a terrible spot, Steve. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. It is, it is pretty fun. You get the, you get the, the city, the city is your district. Yeah. So you get the pretty much freelance. Yeah. It's a big anything sandbox, man. Good, I love it. Yeah. Anything you get, anything that sounds good, you just jump on. Hell yeah. So it's kind of fun. Yep. Um, sure. But, but I'm coming back from a, from an extrication way down South and I 71 was closed due to construction. It's two 30 in the morning. And I'm like, I have to shoot up high street, the main drag. And I'm coming through that area, and I'm like, oh, a lot of people out. 2.30 in the morning, there's still a lot of people out. And uh, I get to 11th and High, which is about eight blocks north of where it happened, that I hear the shooting go out. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, hey, it's just a shooting. Well, then I hear on the, on the police channel, shots fired, multiple people shot. So I spun around. And I get down there, and it was the most chaotic thing I've been a part of in my 33 years. Wow. Um, Thousands of people, I don't know if it's thousands, but there was sure seemed like it. There was a ton of people running in the street, cars trying to get out everywhere. I watched people getting hit by cars. Wow. And, and just getting thrown and getting up and running away. It's chaos. Like, like it was just pure chaos. Yeah. And um, the shooting came out at 625 North High Street. Well, I get flagged down in the 800 block, 845, by police. So I'm like, hey, RS stands here. I've got five victims here, two critical. And the, the EMS supervisor was south of me about four blocks. And he had six shot there in wow. that area. So 11 total. 11 total, which mm. that's not a thing. It's a thing. Don't yeah, get me wrong. I'm I get not it. playing it off as not a thing. Right. But where it was really a thing for us is they weren't all together. Okay. We were spread out over four blocks. So the city police put CPD put out what they call a 10 three officer in trouble, but they did it citywide because they called it an active shooting. So we had pretty much every cop in the city working coming there right now. The crazy part of this is when I get there, I let EMS 10 know the EMS captain. I'm like, Hey, I'm up here. This is my needs. I need five medics, two engines. I got two critical. I'm at 845. He's like, cool. Gotcha. Well then, Medic 7, who is the OSU medic, they came in, 
Jake Susnowitz and Nick Carter did this unbelievable job uh, helping me out there. And, and I'm used to the big city. My perception wasn't reality. Okay. My perception was definitely not reality. When I when you work in a big city, you have a, an opportunity that when you need things, you push the button. When you push the button, things show up. If that's not enough, you push another button and more things show up. Resources are usually not something you lack. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. So, so, so you you have that comfort zone of I could just keep pushing the button until I get what I need. Sure. you got a system of resources. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I'm up there and I keep pushing the button that needs and no one's coming. I had another medic, medic 11, jump the run from OSU Hospital. So I basically have two medics and myself on the north side of this thing. And the EMS captain kept saying, okay, you're getting medic two. Well, medic two started coming up to me and they found another shooting victim. Right. So I didn't get medic two. You see where I'm going with this? Like, yeah, absolutely. Everything just kept going. And all I could think of, I'm like, where's the chief? I should be passing this off and running in the middle of this thing, not the front end of it, right? Chief never showed up. He couldn't get close. My EMS supervisor, uh, John Weisenberger, does a great job. Didn't show up. Why? Couldn't get close to it. There were so many police, you couldn't get close. So I could, all I could think of was Chief Lee, Frank Lee, when we talked about how he runs a high-rise fire, he said, I just write on the wall a lot of times. Right. And I had a Sharpie. So I started just, I literally was writing everything on a, on a window, mm. on a plate glass window. Yeah. That, that's all I could think, because I didn't. I don't carry I don't carry a mass casualty sheet. I don't carry you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because in a normal set of circumstances, you're moving forward. I mean you're you're not in the command post. I mean, I get it. I set it I set it up and then I pass it off. That's right? right. Absolutely. So I guess the moral of the story where I'm going with is we should have broke this off into two incidents. Mm. Because we couldn't see each other. I should have just I should have just taken the north end with a separate tech channel and just ran my thing and he ran his thing. Right. And I think it would have solved a lot of confusion. But the second thing is we have to, when we hit situations like this, I would have been better. I had three shot, uh, a couple shot in the legs, one shot in the arm and shoulder. It, I sh- we should have just thrown them in a paddy wagon and drove them to the hospital. Yeah. The time we had trying to get resources in and out, we probably would have been better off just getting them to the hospital. Everything worked out fine. Nobody died. Uh, the guys did a great job. But, you know, I look at, at, at Jake, and I'm like, from Medic 7, and I'm like, Jake, he's like, I, I might have to crank this guy. And I said, Jake, you got to do it. He goes, I need another medic. I said, I don't have anybody. you got to get it done. Yeah. You, you, you just got to get it done. And they did, and they did a phenomenal job. Um, so it, it just – it's a lot of little things. I should have I should have taken every tarp off of Medic Seven before they left. You know what I mean? Things like that that, that we've talked about, but I didn't do it. Yeah, well, it was it was kind of overwhelming. Yeah, well, and that's it, right? And what what I find very fascinating about this conversation, and I'm I'm so grateful that you're sharing this, is I mean, you are a seasoned firefighter with many years in an officer position, twenty two years, I think you said as a lieutenant in a busy urban engine company, and yet the other night dealt you a deck that you had not seen before or haven't really had to deal with. And now you have to rely on your training and your experience to figure out how that audible is going to play out and, and the lessons learned from that, right? But sometimes we have to learn in the battlefield, right? Yeah, absolutely. But the, the thing that's important to me is mm. – when you make these mistakes, share like stretching from success came from 30 years of my mistakes. Right. Right. And, and the solutions we came up with. So don't just say I made the mistakes. What's the solution? So yes. I was talking to our medical director yesterday and, and we have an ADI response, right? But that ADI response is like, seems like it's 28 companies. You know what I mean? It's crazy. It's the bomb squad. It's the hazmat unit. It's, all of these things. We have a mass casualty response. Well, then you got to, then that triggers, they call the health department and all these other things that it triggers. We had nothing in between. And that was what we discussed yesterday of having possibly creating an EMS task force type of thing where we get five medics and two engines and a chief. You, you know, having something in the middle that doesn't trigger all of the stuff. Yeah. 
but we, we expose the weakness that we have. Sure. But what I love about my job and where I work is they're okay with going, yep, yeah, we have a weakness. We got to fix that. That's right. They, they're not, they're not, they're not ducking behind it. They're going, okay, what's the solution? That's, right. that's huge. Right. Cause when, like I was talking about that before with administration, when they can do that, it allows their people to do the same. How many people are so busy ass slapping and high five. And even when the job goes to shit, right. It happens. It happens a lot because people don't want to take accountability of where they could do better or admitting some fault or admitting some, you know, ill preparedness and people have a hard time taking accountability of that. This episode's brought to you by Teledyne Fleer. Teledyne Fleer is the originator and creator of thermal imaging technology. In 2013, Fleer launched the K-Series camera for the public safety sector, in particular firefighting. They have created cameras over the last 10 years for every position on the fire ground. From tactical to situational, their cameras help us make the right decisions on the fire ground. So check out Teledyne Fleer, check out their product offerings and engage them on their social media and ask them for more information and education in regards to their product. Teledyne Fleer is producing one of the best cameras on the market and they're a proud sponsor and partner of the National Fire Radio podcast. So go over to www.fleer.com and look up the public safety file and you'll find the latest offerings from Teledyne Fleer. I'm just not a fan of celebrating mediocrity. I agree with you. Amen. Talk, I mean, talk about we, that. Go. Well, you just, I'm not, mental health is hugely important. And I've lost a lot of friends to suicide Yeah. in this job. And I think that's very important. But I also think when it comes to the job, we have to be brutally honest with ourselves and with our companies if you're going to grow. It's okay to fail as a company. It's okay. It's going to happen. It's recognizing that, throwing it on the table and saying, I screwed this up, this, this, and this. Okay, well, what are we going to do different next time? And then we train on it. And then what happens? You grow as a company because the next time you have it, you don't make those mistakes and things go well. And you watch morale change in your company in a second just because what? You, you failed together, but you came up with a solution, you trained on it, and then you succeeded together. Yeah. Right? When yeah. we were, when we, we, my company is the one that came up the way we split cars. There's a hundred ways to split cars. We found a problem. Most of my district has cars parked on both sides of the street. So when we're stretching, we probably deal with cars. I would say 90% of the time we're, we're splitting cars of some type. We did it. It was okay. It wasn't great. But I'm like, we, there's got to be a better way. So we worked at it and worked at it and worked at it. Well, this didn't happen overnight. This was about nine months of putting hose on the ground, trying to figure out a teachable solution to a common problem. But when we got it, like, oh, this worked, but this didn't. Okay, keep that. What else can we do? And then when we did it as a company and we finally figured it out, man, the guys, it, it just... It, when you fail together, you, you come up mm. with a solution that it's, it works and you succeed, it increases the buy-in 110-fold. Um, the ownership is huge on that. Absolutely, man. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the, prob- the problem is, though, is a lot of times we have problems on the fire ground. The boss comes out of his office says, hey, you guys screwed up. It wasn't a good job. We need to do better. And then he goes back in, closes his door, and sits at his desk again. I mean, that's, yeah, that, that, I, that doesn't work either. No. And, <laughs> just, and, and I a... think, and I think that's where we get a lot of disconnect within companies and fire departments and where the, the solution isn't an all encompassing solution involving everyone in the process. It becomes very frustrating for a backstep firefighter to have a mediocre boss at best who doesn't offer any solutions or abilities to help better any type of situation. And when you, when you teach mediocrity, that's what you're going to have. And, and we, we have to do better than that. We have to do better than that. And what you talk about, the dedication of nine months of putting hose in the street and working with your guys where you're making mistakes just like they are along the way, but you're also coming through and finding the things that are working. And after nine months of hard work on the streets, you come up with a, with a solution. Brother, that's a freaking yeah. home run, man. That's how but the guys, 
the guys did it. Yes, that's my point. Yeah, it. absolutely. They, they are the ones. Hey, we, let's let's go try this. I got an idea. Yeah, let's we, try this part. We need so much more of that, brother. We really do. We really do. But it's, does it? Does that mean we went and put hose on the ground three hours a day? No. No. The drill doesn't take three hours. We drill in the morning. We check the rig, grab coffee. Everybody meets back. And what do we do? We do the drill. Whatever it is that day, maybe we are stretching that day. Well, you know what? I throw three or four bubbles in the rig, and, and we, we we stretch on the way to get the meal. It's not. It doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out drill. We would go out 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on what we had going that day, and just work with it, right? If, if we didn't feel like going to a, to a vacant, we'd park some cars at the, at the firehouse and just drill with the bundle, see yeah. what worked and did. You know, it's so – sure. It, don't think you've got to go put hose on the ground every single day for three hours a day to get good. You, it, it, it's it's a matter of take what's in front of you and expand on the opportunity, right? Like, like make sure that you have that opportunity. Mm. Um, and and when, you get a t- when you get an opportunity, something unique comes up, run with it. If you got something unique, run with it because it doesn't happen every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so that, those are just a few things that I like to, you know, Charlotte just had that huge fire. Yeah. Guess what My we did gosh. yesterday? Guess what the drill was yesterday? Downtown conflagrations. <laughs> we've got, it was. Yeah. yeah. Because we have literally got like 12 sky cranes on OSU's campus right now building these, what I call, uh, you know, the mid-rise mayhem that's going on in the country. Everywhere. Yeah. Right. Bill mm-hmm. Gustin called it, Bill Gustin called it the modern day balloon frame construction. It's just horizontal. All of those, all of those yeah. landed I beams. It's a good way to put was, it, man. That was Augustine, isn't it? Yeah. And, and yeah. Like, he's right. He's dead right. Um, so there's some things like that. Just take advantage of what's in front of what would we do in that situation? What are we gonna do? Right, it's you got to have the conversations. I love it. Where does this come from from you? I mean, like, what drives you? Where Where does Steve Robertson, after thirty three years, twenty two years as a company boss, you still have an incredible fire within? You travel the country. You're teaching. You're affecting change, educating the next generations and the generations that are here now. What's driving you and, and like literally for you, that personal push, it's a lot on you. Why? It, I, I just, I've always thought that somebody took the opportunity and took the time to mentor me mm. and teach me. And it's like, I feel like I'm cheating the younger generation if I don't pass on what they taught me and the mistakes I've made. And I'm not giving them the same opportunity I had to learn and and just try to be better every day, right? And guess what? I'm not every day. I'm not at my best every day. Yeah. I promise you that. I mean, you've been being like everybody else, but when you have a group of guys that buy in and then you go, you're not having a great day. Hey, boss, can we do this today? What are you going to do? Tell them no? Yeah. Are you going to tell them no? Really, everything you've built is built on that and you're going to tell them no we can't do that you're not going to do that so we drive each other you, you know you drive each other and then some you, you see a problem in the, in the fire service and you're like man this isn't just our problem this, this problem is everywhere you know positioning of apparatus is a, is a big part of my program right cap gustin and i were talking and he's like Stevie, we need to do a hump day hangout with us. This is a problem everywhere. Well, I took that. I took the information from my program, and I'm writing an article for engineering right now on it. So you just, it's not just our problem. If you're having that issue, I would venture to guess the majority of the United States Fire Service is having the same issue. So focus on it. Come up with a teachable solution to a common problem and put it out there. The way you the way you break that down sounds so simple, and yet the process is not. I mean, it can be. We can allow it to be that simple, but man, egos get in the way. Oh, man, you nailed it. Thank you. Yeah, go with that, brother. Please go. But it, 
don't let an ego or, or, or a chief say no, 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 no. No means what? That means no, you can't do that or you can't explore that or no, I can't teach my guys that. I don't believe that's what it means. No means we're not going to adopt that as a, as a part of the SOP. Does that make sense? We're not making a division wide change. I, I, I have a huge mentor in Ray McCormick. I, I think you know Ray and sure. I are, are pretty close. Absolutely. I've been very fortunate to have that guy in my life um, a lot of years. And I, we were talking one day, and he, he looked at me. He's on the phone. And he goes, why are you yelling at me? And I go, what? <laughs> he goes, why are you yelling at me? And I go, well, because you'll listen. And I'm pissed off because I wanted to do this and this, and the division won't let me. And da 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 He goes, stop. What do you control? I said, what do you mean? He goes, do you control Engine 18? I said, yes. He says, do you have any say-so in the battalion? I said, I've got a great battalion chief in Rick Archer. We have great officers in my battalion. He gives me pretty much free reign on the engine training and, and, and the direction we go with engine stuff. He goes, okay, does a deputy really care? And I go, he'll listen to me. Doesn't mean he's going to do it, but he'll listen. He goes, do you really think beyond the Hilton, I have a ton of influence? And I go, man, I would hope so. He goes, I have a little, but he goes, it's not, they, they, it's not their priority, right? So why are you worried about what other people won't let you do? Control what you can control. All I can control is myself and my guys and have them trained to the best of their ability. If the division or your department doesn't want to adapt the training style or whatever you're doing, don't let that stop you from being driven and getting better. Because guess what? The people you're working with eventually are going to be who? They're going to be the leaders. Yeah. Those are going to be the leaders, right? Yeah. I mean, I had a conversation with some guys and, and I, you know, they were talking about the external water versus internal water and the things we learned and, and why are we not switching back to internal water being the, the priority of this and that. And I go, well, he knows is why. These chiefs that pulled the trigger early on, the majority of them that pulled that trigger early on with the exterior study from the well are not going to go back on their word that that's the primary attack. Although we made decisions based on a third of the information, when you look at the interior study and the coordinated attack study, and now even add the firefighter rescue survey in that, when you take that, Jeremy, that's your playbook. Yeah. If you want to save civilian lives, your playbook is right in front of you with those three documents. Yep. That that's it. That that is the that is the recipe for success of saving lives. I said, what you have to realize is the people we're training now are the people that in five to 10 years are going to be who? Decision They're going makers. to be the decision makers. That's right. That's the change we're making. We may not see a wholesale change right this second, but gosh damn it, we're winning. Wow. We I... are winning every day, and if you're just not going to see the impact tomorrow. I love it. We, we, you and I hit on that 30 minutes ago in his podcast where we said that those guys that are promoting that were under you have now promoted past because they chose to and you chose to stay where you are. Those are the guys now in the positions that can affect change because they were the guys in the trenches learning in the streets. I love it. I absolutely love that. It's great. I think the word no is used way too much. I think no is uh, an automatic word in our vocabulary that – that um, it can be can be crippling in some organizations. I think we need to be saying yes more often to our people and let them try, let them work, let them figure it out with the tutelage of you or another mentor. Um, but I believe we need to say yes a little bit more these days too. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, when you say yes, you're empowering your people to 100%. do work way beyond what you're asking them to do. Does that mean, hey, look, yeah, I'd like you to explore that, dig deeper in it. Does, hey, I'm going to be up front. That doesn't mean we're making a wholesale change, but That's let's right. take a look at it. Sure. Let's take a look at it. Sell me. Get the information, vet it, and let's figure it out together. I love that. That's good. If it doesn't work the way they think it does, what happens? We don't make it. Don't change to change. Ray always said, don't change just to change. Change because you found a better way. 
That's good. I, I really like that too, man. I, I've, I've written down so many good quotes tonight, today, brother. <laughs> I love it. So let me ask you this, right? Let's go down another path real quick. You, um, you talked about before I asked you what drives you and you said it's, you know, when you get, when you get together with a group of people and you can affect change and you can promote them as well as, you know, you're, you're paying it back to the people that mentored you and allowed you to become who you've become speaking nationally, teaching nationally. You said you're stretching for success class is 30 years of mistakes. One, you're owning your mistakes and you're being able to, and you're able to build a program around that to make people better, to make the job better. When you travel as much as you do, the conferences you go to, the people that you talk to, I've been with you at too many conferences now. You and I have had many late night discussions and early morning discussions over different subjects of the fire service. Talk to me how important this training culture is that we have right now, the conferences that are happening, and how much does that juice you up when you get there and you have excited students and the impact that, that comes with that? It, it, it makes everything worthwhile. Nice. Like, like, you know, everybody, everybody thinks – Oh, I want to go train. I want to go on the road. I want to do this. Yeah, it's great. I've met, um, I've been so blessed Yeah. to be unbelievable people, Jeremy, you know, and, and build lifelong friendships. Sure. Kurt Isaacson and, and JJ Cassette. I can go right down the line, Todd Edwards and all these guys that uh, we call it our road family because we see each other so much. Jerry Hurts and Andy Clark and we go right down the line. Sure. And, and it's our road family, but at the same time, when you're like, man, I, I'm tired. I don't, I'm going to have to leave here. I got to go back to work. Da, 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 da. And you have somebody come up when you're having a beer at dinner or the social and they're like, Hey man, we tried what you did, what you showed us and it worked. Or you get a phone call or an email a couple weeks later and, and it's, man, that really worked for us. We don't understand the change we've made. That's what continues to drive you to, to keep putting it out there. You, yeah. you know, when, when you know it's vetted information, and I, I say this all the time, don't take my word for any of this. Don't trust me. You, know, you and I have never crawled down a hallway together. Do not trust me. I need you to take the information, vet it, and apply it to what works for you. Mm. Apply it to your neighborhood. You may tweak it this way or that way to make it work for you. Right? Don't think that just because I do it this way is the only way to do it. I'm just giving you a, a, a platform with the information I share. Then you have to take it and apply it to how I don't know your staffing. I don't know your demographics. I don't know what your district looks like. Right. So yeah. it, it's a platform. But when you get that feedback that, that something you gave them work and made the job better for them. That really is what keeps driving you. It, it really does. And you watch culture change. You know, we've been to departments. Todd Edwards and I are on the road a lot together. We've been to departments where we get there the first time we were there. And it's like, oh, boy, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. But then when they see when they see it and then they see the process and they see that everything we're teaching is a process. It's not an individual skill. It's a process that when they do the process right correctly and you go from the morning and then we finish a day later, two days later, and they see the progress they've made, it fires up the entire department. And, and, you know, you get calls from chief, man, you've made a heck of a difference. These guys are fired up. They're out doing this or they're doing that. And it's making it, you know, that's what drives you. It, it, it's because I'm not that smart. I'm a high school educated idiot from Southern Ohio. I just love what I do. I love the job. And I, and I want to afford everybody the same opportunity to succeed in the job that I've had and give them the information to do that. I love it. I love it. I'd like to say this. I think um, I opened the podcast, you know, when I do, when I do the intros in the beginning of the podcast, I, I, you know, make a couple comments, typically how I know the individual. And I said very early on in this episode, when I opened up, I said that I was intimidated by you in the beginning. Um, and I, I say that with a, with a big smile on my face, because in fact, you know, being a student of the fire service, like I believe I've been and, and how much I absolutely love the process and the fire service in general, I know that there are people that were, uh, important to me, uh, coming up and you were certainly one of them. Um, I, I think what I take away most from you, Steve, and, and, and why I respect you so much is your approach, 
Um, you know, it comes off in a it comes off in a very guarded way until you get trusting enough to know the individual. And when you and I have now have a mutual trust for one another, it now you the it opens up to this incredible opportunity to know you and the knowledge and fun and experience that comes with that. And I, I mean that with the, the biggest smile and the biggest heart that I appreciate you more than you know and the conversations that you and I have, the candidness that you have with people, but let alone me. I mean, I remember one of our first interactions, you told me, shut up. You just told me, shut up and stop selling, right? And and to me, like, I God, I appreciate that more than you'll ever, ever know. It and wasn't so, personal, though. Right? That's, that's what personal. I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's, it was just, it, it was one of those things that you were trying to sell me so much. I'm like, okay, we've broken the ice. Let's just talk, <laughs> right? And, and you're yeah. like, we can do this. And I want National Fire Radio to do this and this. And I'm like, it'd be a favor. And you're like, what? I'm like, that was at Applebee's, I believe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we might have had a few <laughs> in us by then, but yeah, absolutely. And I finally looked at you and I went, would you do me a favor? Like that? <laughs> Shut up and listen for five minutes. I love Quit it. Quit selling me. I love it. I love it, man. That that to me was a moment that I had, and I, I think sometimes I always try to sell or or continue the conversation more than I need to, uh, because it's it's those eggshell moments where I'm I'm talking with people that I'm kind of intimidated by, and I'm a listen I'm a big guy with an ego and and all of that, but I also know when to check it at times. But sometimes it just gets a little. Uh, it gets a little away from me when I'm talking with people that I have so much respect for um, and so on. Because but Jeremy, I, if you look at the same conversation, it's the same conversation Ray Corbett had with me. 100%. 100%. Same conversation 100%. when he goes, why are you yelling at me? Yes, like, like, exactly. Listen to what I'm telling you. I love it. Get off your high horse and listen. Yeah. Let it digest, and then we'll talk about it, right? Like So I think everybody, regardless of their time in the fire service, We'll have that moment yeah. where a mentor needs to just say, hey, stop, just yes. listen, Yeah. right? It's not, it, it, a lot of what builds in us is frustration, right? And you got to have that person to dump the tank to, absolutely. But don't take everything so stinking personal that it, there was nothing personal about that, right? right? 100%. There was nothing personal about what Ray said to me. Yeah. You have to be a little bit thick-skinned to go, okay, he's right. You know, I'm out of line here. Or I'm, I'm doing this, and I shouldn't be doing that. Everybody needs check now and then. And I, I don't care I love those moments. how long you've been in the fire service. Everybody needs check. I couldn't agree with you more. And that's why I wanted to bring this up because it certainly was a moment for me. And, and, and through all of that over the last, say, five years now that we've known each other, I've truly enjoyed your friendship, and um, this is yeah, the first. Absolutely. This is the first time that you've been on the actual podcast. We've done some projects together, uh, different things, and we, you know we've conversed before, you know, about topics like this, but never on the podcast itself. So, I just want to say thank you for joining me today, man. I mean, you and I could talk for hours and hours, but you know, I like to keep it to like an hour or so. We're just under an hour, but. I just truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know how busy you are, but, you know, it means the world that you're trusting enough to be here to share your story with me, but also our listeners. But I think ultimately you bring unbelievable value to the fire service. And um, and it's done through a very, uh, very straightforward and candid type of way. And it's done through experience and knowledge but your willingness to share it in a real way. And um, for that, man, I'm grateful. I appreciate you very much, Steve. Thank you. And I, I appreciate you having me, Jeremy. And, and again, if I come off that way, I, it's my thing is, I, what do we learn from a critique where everybody, hey, nice job, guys, the fire went out, everybody's going home. Exactly. At what point are we going to be humble enough to ourselves, the job, and the citizens we serve to throw it on the table and go, <sighs> we screwed this up, fellas? I love it. We screwed up. You know, when I got to the 3rd Battalion years ago, we had a fire and it didn't go well, I didn't think. I was like the third engine and I'm like, good Lord, this sucks. We got, we got a lot of work to do. And it was young bosses at the time and da 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 a hundred things happened. But the critique, yeah, 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 we did this, it was okay. We did this, it was okay. It got to me and I'm like, what fire were you guys on? <laughs> this, I love it. This was terrible. <laughs> I like, love like, it. And it, it, 
But it really bothered me so much. <laughs> I called my battalion chief like two days later at home. And I'm like, chief, we got to meet for a beer. And he's like, what's up? I said, we just got a few things I got to talk about. I got to get some stuff off my chest. And so we met for a drink and um, we're talking. And I go, the next fire we have, I don't care where I show up in the order, I'm going first in the critique. He's like, why? I said, just, I want to try something. I don't know if it'll work or not. And again, like I said, at the time, we had very young bosses in the battalion. I was a senior boss. And I get there, and we had a good, just a little two-room job, and I was second. And then, uh, hey, Steve, you want to go first? I said, sure. You know, we, we missed, we could have done this a little better. I missed this. The side entrance, we could have probably done something there, da, 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 whatever it was. I think like four things that I could have personally yes. done better as a boss. Yes. And it opened the floodgates of St. Mary's. Those young bosses looked at me like, holy shit, he just threw it on the table. Like, is it okay to make a mistake? Yeah. And it changed the way we did our tailboard talks, our critiques, whatever you want to call them. It changed it because it put guys at ease that we were not judging them. That's right. For making a mistake. We, 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 we can't judge people for making a mistake. All we have to do is admit it turn on it and move on because when we that's the that's the reason nobody wants to show their weakness that's right nobody wants to be that guy look i could go out with my guys right now and stretch every day right we could stretch every single day my guys are putting that hose line on the ground in 15 to 20 seconds every day and they're damn good at it i'm not stretching it there but they're damn good at what they do is we need to do that skill but you better start training to your weakness, right? I, if you don't yeah. train to your weakness, you're not getting any better. You're maintaining. We have to identify the weakness and train to it. And until you identify it, guess what? You're never going to get any better. You're going to stay stagnant. Train to your weaknesses. Is that comfortable? Is it comfortable that I hate throwing 24 foot ladders? No, it's not comfortable, but do we do it? Yeah, why? Mm. Because we're a single engine, we pull up. I got to be able to throw a 24 if we need to do it. Yep. But if we don't admit to those things, if we don't buy into training to your weakness and not just kicking the crap out of somebody because that isn't their best skill, we're never going to grow. We're going to stay stagnant as a company. So put, put the bullshit aside and be a company and fail together and then succeed together and train to your weakness. Everybody can train to their strength. You ever have the, uh, the company officer that does the same drill every time? Yeah, of course. Why? Because they know that drill Since inside and out. He's got it. And they'll, yeah. never, and they'll never expose, they know every question that could be asked, and they'll never expose themselves to any weakness at all. That's right. That's not growing. No. And it and it sets the it sets the table for the others that are impacted by that, and their careers are going to very much go the same. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's hard. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. What is next for Steve Robertson? What's going on? Uh, I am in Kent, Ohio next week, uh, first week of June, going three days up there with Kent Fire. Cool. Um, and then I got where am I at? I've got uh, Blue Ash, Ohio, and then. Let me look at the calendar here. It's I crazy. Can't track of it. I I can't um, imagine. Blue Ash, and then uh, I'm in U Illinois. We're up in um, Calumet City. Myself and Jimmy Davis and cool. uh, Ronnie Smith. Uh, and then I've got the Ohio Fire Chiefs. I got asked to do a keynote for the Ohio Fire nice. Chiefs. So I'm pretty excited about yeah, that. That's I cool. don't know if they realize what's coming, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think they do. I think they do. Uh, you kidding me? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, it's going to be fun. I'm going to be with my buddy Mark Knopp in there. So, we, yeah. you know, we always have a good time when we're together. And, cool. Uh, so, yeah, I'm staying busy. Uh, July, I'm trying to take July off and spend time with the family at the lake a little bit. My good. wife asked me the other day why we own a boat. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, i got to figure that out, why we still own a boat. So well, I'm hoping to spend get, make it, most of make July use there. Of it. Yeah. Absolutely. You need to, for right. sure. Well, listen, man, I um, I appreciate you. Thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule today to spend some time with me and our community at National Fire Radio. It just means the world. And uh, listen, I appreciate you as a brother. And um, you've really set 
set a lot of good uh, benchmarks for me as a person and uh, as a firefighter. And just through our conversations over coffee or a cold one, um, I appreciate those moments with you, man. So thank you very much for everything you've done for me and uh, your trust in me and the platform just means the world. So Steve, thank you very much, man. I appreciate you. Absolutely, Jeremy. Keep doing what you're doing with National Fire Radio. Like I said, I wasn't sure what it was when I first got involved, so yeah. I was dipping my toe in the water a little bit to see what it. the temperature was. But sure. I, what you and Rob and the guys are doing is unbelievable. I believe in it. Thank you. And anything I can do to help you and support you, I'm happy to. Yeah, I know that. And thank you, man. That means the world to me. Trust me. It really does. So thank you, everyone. Steve Robertson, the Columbus, Ohio Division of Fire. Steve, thanks for joining me. Stay right here. I'm just going to sign off the podcast, and I'm going to come right back to you, okay? So hang on one sec. All right. Cool. Guys, thank you for tuning in for another episode of the National Fire Radio Podcast. We only scratched the surface today with Steve Robertson. I'd love to get him back on down the road. we got a thousand other things we could discuss, and we will. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for coming to the podcast, spending an hour with us today and hearing Steve's story. Um, I think it was a great conversation with a lot brought to the table. So do me a favor. Speaking of the table, take this conversation, take it back to the kitchen table at the firehouse and talk about it. Because when we talk about the job, we're making the job better. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks for tuning in. Jeremy, National Fire Radio.